It says, tune my heart to sing thy praise. I had to tune the piano this morning so it would sing its praise better. And we need tune too, don't you think? Upcoming 
announcements, uh, but I would ask you to be remember the fundraisers of the of, of uh, Pathfinders for their upcoming missions trip. Um, I think purchasing the candle. I think the deadline is gone on that. But you should have a flyer that looks something like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Should look like that. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, it should have something about something flying. About uh, taking the photographs or video of your property or your business or something like that. Uh, Daniel's offering $20 a shot. Uh, that means a photo shoot. And uh, all the money, every bit of it, goes towards the missions trip funding for that. So um, please, uh, please think about that and contributing to that. All right, well, let's, call, let's open in prayer and just, just uh, close out everything else, all thoughts. that We're going to render them captive in Christ Jesus. We're going to try our best to get rid of all distractions. Lord, we just ask that you would fill our minds with nothing but praise this morning, oh God. God. No matter what we've experienced, no matter what we've come through, um, Lord, we have genuine concerns. We face genuine challenges. There are genuine sorrows. But Lord, we want to focus on the joy of our salvation. We want to focus on the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and that wonderful message of hope and love and forgiveness that you've given us to share with others. Father, I pray today that your presence, O oh God, would be especially felt in our midst, that the presence of Jesus in our lives and his faithfulness would especially fill our hearts and thoughts, the the peace and comfort and love of the Holy Spirit who has come to shed about God's love in our hearts. Lord, I just pray that, oh God, you would just fill us and strengthen us and comfort us and direct us, Lord, purge out all distractions so that we see and think of only you today. And in those thoughts and in our praise and in our worship, Lord, may Jesus Christ be rightly exalted and worshiped. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Light of the world, you stepped out.
Our King of Heaven, our ruler thou art, I believe that was. Praise the Lord. As our King and Lord, I think we have plenty of things to uh, thank Him and praise Him for. And again, uh, we would like to provide opportunity for you to share how God has shown Himself faithful to you this week. Maybe an answer to prayer. Uh, we get a lot of them, by the way. You've noticed that. I hope you have noticed it. Uh, but somehow, that, how God has been faithful, we'd like to encourage you to share that with the church family today. So if you have a reason to praise the Lord, share it with us. It works. All right. Cindy? Okay. I praise the Lord um, because after almost a year after our son Gene's death, Brenda was able, our daughter was able to go down and to Virginia and she was sworn in to be administrator of his estate and very fortunately he had like, um, oh, two properties and also a house. Um, there was a land developer who said that um, if, if she was willing, he looked at all this stuff and he said, he said, I'll take it all and um, for a price. And he gave her the price, and she said that would be wonderful. So she did bring her back a few things that she really wanted, and um, there's a few things that um, Jean's really good friend will be getting. And supposedly, and hopefully, and prayerfully, we um, pray that um, on November 7th, the closing is supposed to be. So we praise the Lord and thank everybody who's prayed, too. This has been a long time coming. But we pray and praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Answer to prayer. Thank oh, you. Oh, very much so. Thank yes. you, Cindy. In a wonderful way. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, anybody else in this section of reason to praise the Lord today that you'd like to share? All right, Ted. Yeah, I just thank the Lord that Dakota's back with us after a trip with her into Florida with her mom and they came back and hopefully stay in four years. <laughs> Amen. We can continue to keep that situation in prayer for sure. Uh, anyone else here would like to have a word, share a word of praise? Do I have any hands over on this side? Anybody over here you'd like to share some testimony or a praise? About what God has done, how faithful He has. Where is that photograph? It was already the top of the service. Oh, okay. So one praise from the Hemlock family. Their tribe has increased yet again. They have Emmanuel Joseph Cochran. Nine pounds two ounces. What's that? Nine pounds two ounces. There, there he is. And they're going to call him Manny. I think I understood that. So uh, Olivia. And a child, Manny, are doing well, and I assume everybody else is, but um, 20 inches, 9 pounds, 2 ounces. So congratulations to Grandpa and Grandma Hemlock. So anybody else? That's, a, that's another answer to prayer right there. Anybody else a reason to praise the Lord you'd like to share today? You can just stay with me. We need to hear every word of it, John. John friend, I was here in his family with us today. Back with us. I'd just like to thank the church family for all their prayers and cards and uh, everything that went on with Mom here over the last couple of weeks here. I just uh, feel the family here, and I just want to say thank you for all your thoughts and prayers. All right. Any others? You know, I kind of like this aspect of doing things because I get a little exercise, my blood gets stirring and stuff, so I don't fall asleep during the message. <laughs> All right, Reverend Bean was going to come up and lead us in a word of prayer. Wouldn't that be interesting if the pastor fell asleep during the message? <laughs> Never seen that happen. <laughs> what a privilege to come to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you today that we have the privilege of calling on your name 
Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your great sacrifice for us at Calvary. It gave us the joy and the privilege of knowing that we've been adopted into the family of God. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, your loving kindness, your tender mercies. Thank you, Lord, for being with us in the good times, in the bad times, when we're facing difficult trials, when we're facing loss. You're there. Your assurance is you never leave us. You never forsake Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for Cindy's testimony today of how you've been with them and provided a buyer for everything. Lord, you've been so good. We thank you. We pray, Lord, now that you'll just continue to help them as they get everything finalized and settled. And Lord, we just praise you for answering our many prayers on their behalf. We thank you also, Lord, for Manny's arrival safely and that mom and baby are doing well. Continue to strengthen that family, we pray. We want to remember again today the Frano family in the passing of John's mother. We're so thankful, Lord, that there's comfort that comes from above. And that's what we pray for this family, that very special comfort that you give. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We mourn, yes. We've suffered loss, but we're thankful, Lord, that you're there to be our comfort and our strength. Be with them in the next months of dealing with this loss. Help them, oh God. There's a lot to be settled, and we pray that you would help them and strengthen them and direct them and guide them. We want to remember our Bible bookstore leader, Mr. Watson. You know the body condition that he's dealing with is kidney disease and we're thanking you Lord that you're the great physician you've kept him well in the midst of a lot of illnesses over the years and you can touch him now and we're going to thank you dear Lord for working and meeting in that situation Lord we continue to bring Linda to the Lord in prayer Lord, you know this need. You know her every need. And we're thanking you, dear Jesus, for working in her life, touching her and meeting her every need. And Lord, be with Janice as she deals with this as well. Strengthen her and encourage her and help her through this difficult time. We want to pray also, Lord, for this friend that's struggling with depression. Lord, your victor, and we pray that you would bring them deliverance from this severe depression and give them a complete deliverance. Thank you, Lord, for working in that situation. Lord, our church has members in their family that do not know you. That concerns us because we know as we see the things that are happening in our world, that we look up, for we know our redemption draws nigh. But we look up with concern in our hearts for those that we love that have not turned their hearts over to you. Oh Jesus, don't let them wait too long. Holy Spirit, go to those yes. homes. Yes, go to those lives. Break through, Lord, we pray. Yes. And Lord, if you give us the opportunity, give us the boldness to speak out for thee, so that, Lord, when they, we stand before you, we can say we did our best, Lord, to get them into the kingdom. We don't want to have failed them, Lord, in getting them there. We want to remember this awful situation in the Ukraine. And we pray, Lord, for the Christians in Russia that are dealing with this situation. And even the uprising that's going on in Russia over all that's taken place. Lord, you know this situation. And we also know that you're the only answer. So, oh God, we pray, break through in a very special way. We'll thank you and we'll give you praise. This service is yours. And Lord, we ask you to look on the congregation today. And you, Lord, not only see each one here, 
but you see each need represented here. So Lord, we pray that you would minister in a very special way. Touch those ones that need that special touch today. Break through in their lives and give them glorious victory. We thank you, Lord, for answering prayer. We'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' most worthy name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to be looking into a very ancient book. But it was a book that was breathed out by the God of the universe. And he's going to teach us. I hope that book is becoming more and more precious to you every single day. This is a good prayer to pray. Holy words, long preserved for us.
Children's Church. Children may be dismissed for Children's Church. Thank you. Ancient words, but still alive and sharper than any two-edged sword and powerful for today, right? Join with me in prayer for our hearts and for the word in just a moment. Lord, we just pray, God, as we come into your word, Holy Father, we pray that as ancient as they are, as ancient as, as time, Lord, it was in your heart before it was even in creation. So, Lord, we pray that you would just take the words from your holy word that's been inspired, it's from your heart, it's from your mind. And Lord, we just pray you would open our hearts. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher today, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to believe and receive and apply all that you give to us today, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go through the book of Judges, we're in chapter 3, so I would invite you to turn to Judges chapter 3 today. Uh, just a quick review. Last week... Our focus was on friendship with the world, and which leads to failure in our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey. And we learned that God allows trials and tests in our life to develop awareness and resistance to the attractions and alliances with godless influences and interests from our environment around us. And that is kind of what we... Uh, we're focusing on last week. Today, I just wanted to start with just a few reminders in terms of the book of Judges or who the judges really were. A judge in biblical times, in the Old Testament times, in the book of Judges, actually, was a ruler or a leader of God's people that God personally chose. There was no election that took place. It just says God wrote, raised these judges up and he established them in that position doesn't expound on that it doesn't exactly say how he did it but it just says God raised up judges and they were to be saviors of the people they were to save the people now not in spiritual salvation like we might think but the word the Bible says to save the people is the reason that they were raised up so they were people who were rulers or leaders um, that God had raised up, he chose them to help his people. Technically, a judge has responsibility to preside over disagreements, uh, legal issues, to establish justice, and promote the practice of the Torah or the Jewish law. Now that's from the, from the Bible dictionary. If you go to Merriam-Webster, a judge is one who judges. And don't you just love the definitions like that? Just makes everything just crystal clear when, you, when, when it's explained to us like that. But the definition I gave you technically was, was right out of the Bible, a Bible dictionary of how it was used and how it was meant. But practically speaking, practically speaking, and mostly through the book of Judges, the judges seemed or served more like wartime leaders in, as an instrument of God to the people become released from their bondage or being conquered from the pagan rulers. Um, and so in the process of that, they were, they were, they were referred to as judges, but they were really more uh, wartime leaders. Morally speaking, morally speaking, they were people who led God's people back into a right relationship with Him, which in turn led them back into periods of freedom from their oppressors and rest from wartime involvement. So I, out of all of those, I think sort of the last not as much a definition, but a list of the responsibilities of what they did to lead the people back to God, to, to lead them to repentance back to God, and uh, God used them during that time to save the people. But thirdly, while 
judges were imperfect people, yet they were people that God chose and raised up to be used by God to help his people, for God's people. And the Bible says that, again, with the imperfect judge, the imperfect leader, God was with the judges. In other words, God was using the judges. They were there for God's purpose as God's tool to help his people. So morally speaking, that's what judges were. Imperfect people, but chosen by God. We'll be reading today from Judges chapter 3, so I hope you're in chapter 3. Our title for this morning's lesson is The Secret of Success. How many of you have wanted to know that your whole live long life? You know? Yeah, lots of books about that. But when we think about success, success from heaven's perspective is a far cry from a shallow, earthly, or worldly definition of success. I found a quote this week and I uh, included it in the bulletin from Francis Chan. And good old Francis says this regarding success. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that really don't matter. Boy, I, the more I thought about that, I thought, how wow, it's just kind of right on track. There's so many things that can distract us. The things that we want, the things that we had planned, uh, our dreams, the American way. And sometimes those things lead us to really kind of a wasted life of things that really don't matter when it comes to eternal issues. Success is our spiritual journey, in our spiritual journey, does not depend on whether or not we receive the cheers of those around us, but by whether or not we have lived and ministered in a way that had been pleasing to God and has allowed His Spirit to work through us for His purposes. And that's on the back of your bulletin in the, in the notes section. Success in our spiritual journey does not depend on whether or not we receive the cheers of those around us, but by whether or not we have lived and ministered in a manner that had been pleasing to God and has allowed His Spirit to work through us for His purpose. I think when we get at the end and look back, if we've kind of done that, then we can say, thank you, Lord, for a successful life. So from Judges chapter 3, verse 7, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, which were local pagan false gods. Verse 8, Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathayim, and they served Cushan Rishathayim eight years. But the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, Verse 10, and the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands. And that was the pagan king who had conquered them and was presently ruling over them when God raised up Othniel as a judge. As a result of that, they were freed, freed from him. And so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So today, point number one is we're thinking through this, what was going on and what was, what we can learn from Othniel, this, this uh, one judge. 
one of the things that we learn starting off is that the people, and it should be a lesson to us, the people began to learn that God will not relent when his people turn back to him. If, if, if we were in God's place, probably early in chapter 1, we would have said, okay, we're done. We're done. We gave it a good try. We got this far, but zap, you're gone. You know, if, if I was in charge, you know, but thankfully I'm not. But God had this covenant with his people, and they could not shake that covenant because it was a covenant between God and his people, the idea that God would never leave them, and that as long as they followed God, trusted him, worshiped him, that God himself would drive out their enemies. But when they did not worship God and fell into idolatry, which is spiritual adultery, God kept his covenant. Because part of his covenant, part of his promise was, if you go after false gods, I'm just going to step back and let you experience the consequences. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to destroy you from the face of the earth, but I will allow you to experience the circumstances of your own sins. And so that's what was happening when Cushan, Risha, Thiam took them over. And so we might ask the question, what comes first? Do prayers and repentance come first? This would seem like all a part of what was going on here, which brings about God's Holy Spirit, life-changing revival. Or does God's work of revival actually begin first in order to bring about prayer for God to help and repentance from their sins? We learn that freedom from pagan rulers was not the most important achievement in the life of Israel, but success in sustaining a right relationship with God. One thing about Revivals, they never last. Never have they ever lasted. They start, they're powerful, but they don't last. So revival in and of itself is not a goal. It's a step that can help us get to the goal. But the goal is a consistent, consistent, sustaining, spiritual, deep relationship with God. That's what God wants. So the path of sanctification has its work. It accomplishes its good work and God relents. The people repent and God relents. The people repent, God relents. The people repent and God relents. God's purpose in discipline is to purify, sanctify, and restore his people. That's what we focused on last week. And that's what begins to take place here in verse 9. But when the people of Israel cried out to God, there's, there's the prayer, prayer of desperation. Lord, help us. Lord, save us. Would, Lord, would you deliver us? The Lord heard. And the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And you know how long King Cushan, Risha, Thiam reigned over the people eight years. Eight years. And so it seems like eight years is what it took by being conquered by a, and ruled by a pagan king for the people to come to their own senses. It's almost like the story of the prodigal son. He was out whooping it up with his friends, spent all of his inheritance that his father gave to him, living a wild and riotous and sinful life. But then the Bible says, but when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, and we see over after eight years, somehow the people kind of became the, began to come to their senses and they cried out to God after eight years of being enslaved by this pagan king. So God blesses his people for this path of sanctification as grievous, as, as painful as it was, it was effective. 
And so the people repent and God relents and he brings up or raises up a judge to deliver and to save the people. So here we see with under his covenant with his people that God displays his mercies and does not treat his people the way they deserve to be treated. Which was just to say, I'm forgetting about you. I'm walking away from this one. Or I'm letting you be you know, destroyed, utterly destroyed. But the Lord displays his mercies and does not treat his people as they deserve. God demonstrated his own love for them. See if this sounds familiar to you. God demonstrated his own love for them in that while they were still sinful idolaters, sinful spiritual adulterers, yet because of their desperate and humble prayer, doesn't say here that they got all their life cleaned up. Just says they humbled themselves and they prayed and God heard from heaven and answered their prayer and delivered them from the pagan oppressive king through their deliverer, Othniel. Each time this, circ this cycle occurs in Judges, it reminds me of sort of a foreshadowing all of this sin, sacrifice, punishment, repentance, sin, sacrifice, punishment, God bringing them back, sin, sacrifice. And you know, this cycle reminds me of foreshadowing of the coming Savior, Jesus. God's just saving them over. And, and it's, this seems before the, the Levitical system, of the sacrifices were already, um, I'm not sure, I, I guess they were involved in that. It doesn't say which sacrifices that they offered, but it does say they cried out and did what it took for, and they repented, did what it take, took for God to relent and to, to turn them back in the direct, direction of blessing and right relationship with him. Under the judge, God gave his people victory again. While this repetitive cycle reflects the unstable spiritual nature of not just the Israelites, but I think of all humanity, um, it also reflects God's faithfulness. God didn't say, okay, one more time, and pow, you're going to get it. But he just keeps... As long as they're repenting, he keeps coming back. And it reflects the unchanging faithfulness of God in his covenant with his people. They will be saved from their oppressors and their enemies as they trust, trust in God. So we see the path of sanctification, one of suffering, is successful. Hey, success. Some of us would not necessarily say that I would like that type of success, but it's successful. God's people repents, God relents, steps back, shows himself to be merciful, and brings the people another deliverer. And so it was Othniel, Othniel. And we met him back in Judges chapter 1. As he demonstrated his courage as a warrior under Joshua and Caleb. He was the first of the judges during a time of transition in leadership from Joshua and Caleb to a king that was yet to be appointed. And so God chose Othniel not as a king, but as a judge. And the Bible says God was with his judges. Therefore, we know God was with Othniel, the first judge, in a very special way. We're going to see that in just a minute. But what do we know about Othniel? Othniel's name means Lion of God. Lion of God. We know that he was from the tribe of Judah. From 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 1 and 13. You might want to jot these down and go back and look them up. I sort of found this progression of things regarding um, Othniel's um, background and his lineage. His name meant Lion of, Lion of God. He was from the tribe of Judah. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 1 and 13. And in Genesis chapter 49... 
This passage of scripture reflects the association of the symbol of lion and of strength and of success and position. So when we look at Genesis 49, this is where Jacob is taking the opportunity to bless all of his sons. And Jacob is, is passing on a blessing to his sons, which were, in reality, they were prophecies over his sons, but it was given as a blessing. Genesis 49, verse 8 and following says, Judah, this is the Judah becomes, his lineage becomes the tribe of Judah, his family members. Judah, your brothers, it shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of all your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp or cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He, he stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? This is talking about Judah and what his name and what his tribe was going to be known as. Verse 10, And the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall become the obedience of all the peoples. So what do we know about him from that? Well, we know the tribe of Judah would be known for having a good reputation among God's people. We know that. We know that the tribe of Judah would be known as mighty warriors. We know that from Genesis 49, from that blessing and from that prophecy. But also we know that the tribe of Judah would be the lineage from which Jesus the Messiah would come. Many scholars view these final descriptions as pertaining to the future ruler king of Israel, our Lord Jesus himself, where in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so Othniel, his name means lion of God, and we see that progressions. We see that his background is interesting according to scripture. But Othniel, what's more important with, about Othniel is that he was DUI. Did you know that? A deliverer under the influence. Verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Seven times that phrase is in the book of Judges. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands, and his hand prevailed over the king. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. The Spirit of the Lord was in him. God promised that I will be with the judges. And once he gets a judge, it says the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Both of those are important. Both of those phrases, the Lord was with them, the Spirit of God was upon him, indicating that God had chosen them, God was working through them. Doesn't mean they were perfect, doesn't mean they were sinless. We're not sure they would be good leaders if it weren't for God being with them and the Spirit of God being upon them. That's the only reason they were successful as we see. So he was a, he was a, he was a, Deliverer under the influence, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. God was with him. The Holy Spirit was upon him for great victory. Was he a man of great wisdom? I don't know that we can know that from Scripture. Was he a man of great power? It's hard to say. He was used as a warrior, chapter 1, chapter 3. He was a deliverer. As we read this regarding Kushan Rishathayim, it, it sounds like something miraculous took place because it specifically says the Lord was with was upon him. So it wasn't just it wasn't just him out there just saying, "Okay, I'm coming, guys. I'm going to take you down." But it was the Spirit of God at work. 
They turned to God. People did. They trusted in Him. And for a time, they obeyed Him. So when we go back and look in Scripture about the first judge, Othniel, I was wanting to see more details of his life. I was hoping to see, well, this guy, you know, what made him so good? Was he talented? Um, did he have awards? And I think, I'm pretty sure, that not much of the details of what Othniel did are recorded here. Why they're not recorded here? Because that's not our focus. That's not God's purpose. God's purpose is to show us not how mighty a person can be, but how faithful God can be when His unmighty people have a right relationship with Him. I believe that's the purpose here. I believe, there's, I believe that's why the details of Othniel are kind of, are kind of vague and lacking because the focus is on what God did. God chose. God was with. The Spirit of the Lord was upon. It seemed like there was this miraculous uh, deliverance or rescue from the king of Mesopotamia. So we know that the Holy Spirit's purpose at least from what we know from the New Testament. His purpose is to purify. His purpose is to convict. His role is to equip, to direct, to comfort, to teach, and to direct all the attention onto the Lord Jesus. We know that for sure. So we couldn't write a book. If we went to the bookstore, he went to gospel bookstore and said, Keith, give me a book on how to become like Othniel. You know what he's going to say? We don't have one. There's no book that, that marks out the strategy that he used, the, 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 the traits and the character that he had, that just charismatic personality that he possessed. Doesn't have all that. Because none of that is important. In fact, he was quite probably lacking in a lot of those areas. Which reminds us again how important it is for us to have that right relationship with our God so that His Holy Spirit can be fully upon us but empowering us. You know, the Bible, one of the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is in the Old Testament we see the Holy Spirit coming upon somebody for a special purpose, but really not abiding within them. When you get to the New Testament, the Bible teaches very clearly that when we're when once we trust Christ, that the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. He makes his home in our in this carcass, in our soul, in our body, in our life. And so we become temples of the Holy Spirit because that's how that's why. It's not like a place where it's necessarily all that pure, but it's because the Holy Spirit of God dwells in this temple right here. So Othniel was DUI. He was a deliverer under the influence of the Spirit of the Lord. And I want just to look at a few things through trait, a few traits in Scripture that lets us know how important the Holy Spirit is in our lives, in our work, in our ministry. Uh, to, it's important to be led by the Holy Spirit and to be uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are led by God and equipped to face satanic attacks or temptations. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and following. And Jesus, who was full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. It says, just prior to Jesus being tempted, it says he was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us, helps all of God's people 
to be equipped to resist and stand against the satanic temptations. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit helps us to know God's will. Ephesians 5, 17 and 18 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit of God, being controlled by the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to renew us, to purify us, to teach us, to convict us. That is important in understanding and knowing and discovering and following God's will for our lives. Acts 4, verse 8 and 10. The Holy Spirit gives courage for us to appropriately testify of Jesus Christ. Acts 4, verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people of the, of the elders, rulers of the people and elders, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man standing before you, was healed. So it says, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he gives this courageous and very appropriate testimony of Jesus Christ and his power helping and healing uh, a crippled man. And then Acts 13, verse 49 and 52 the Holy Spirit helps us, helps us to be resilient towards opposition. And we all need that. If we're true believers in Christ, we're going to be opposed. We're going to face the attacks of the evil one. Often it comes through other people. Acts 13, verse 49 through 52. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. They were persecuted. Uh, they were beaten a few times. They were run out of town. You don't see them leave leaving. Oh, well. Oh, well. I had another bad day. Let me tell you about my day. I, 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 was, I, was, I was opposed. Somebody didn't agree with me. Somebody wasn't nice to me. Somebody didn't agree with my faith. We tend to act like that. What is unlikely for us as humans, and I think is definite, definite evidence of the Holy Spirit in a person. We can say there's lots of evidence of the Holy Spirit. But the disciples were filled with joy. After they were afflicted and they were filled with joy. Not mocking, not being silly, but they were filled with joy after having been oppressed. Filling of the Holy Spirit can cause us to, to experience joy <clears throat> in the face of persecution. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word with much affliction, but also with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Paul was a man that had that joy. His back scarred with stripes. <coughs> Don't tell how much time he spent in prison because of Jesus. And yet he was a man who from prison can write his own people and say, hey, be joyful. Be joyful. Don't, don't, don't worry about me. Don't mope around because of me. Be full of joy. Be full of joy. So I wanted to, I wanted to, I'm just trying to find the place I wanted to end because I wanted to be sure that I ended at this place. I'm going to use this as part of our closing for today. We spoke that there was not a lot of details about the person of Othniel. Some things we had to search through the scriptures and glean it from here and get out a Bible dictionary. But it doesn't just say here where the man is mentioned as the judge. This is what he was like. So there's not a lot of sensational things. We know that he captured the inhabitants of Debir in chapter 1. We know that he married Caleb's daughter, whatever that's worth.
But I think the most important things are the ones that are glaring. He was a man under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He brought the nation of Israel back into a right relationship with God. And the nation was at rest for 40 years. The things that are of utmost importance, that's it. That's it. That is a successful judge in my part. The secret of the success for these judges, or especially for Othniel, the Lord was with him, and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, was upon him. I'd say that's pretty significant. Not flamboyant. Scripture doesn't make much references to him being a sensational leader or a sensational person. The section um, doesn't end with, oh, let's hear it for Othniel. Hip, hip. You know, let's give this guy the red badge of courage. All hail Othniel. Doesn't, doesn't do anything like that. Only the Holy Spirit was upon him. And Israel was at rest for 40 years. Nothing that we've read so far is more important than this. Nothing is more positive that we've come, that we've read so far than this. Israel was at rest for 40 years. Some have said that this statement provides the brightest hope in the entire book of Judges. So it is significant in terms of his legacy and his contributions to his people. You know, it shows that we don't need to strive towards being having a sensational life or we don't have to work and, and, and try to make people think we're some phenom at what we do. That would, that would bring fame, that would be a t attraction to us rather than to the Spirit of God working in us. But just to strive to be a success in keeping God first, loving, serving, trusting, worshiping Him first and foremost over all other interests and influences around us. Every day we have opportunity to make a significant contribution to God's kingdom. We have the opportunity to direct others to Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to help others see and experience their encounters with God, their own encounters, and to help them find salvation for their eternal souls and peace, peace with God. The secret of success. God did not glorify Othniel. God used Othniel to glorify himself, to glorify God himself. And that's what God wants to do. The success of of, uh, the secret of success may be this, two things. Purpose in our hearts to be filled with and be under the influence and used by God's Holy Spirit and for God to use us in ways that doesn't focus on us, doesn't leave people thinking what a great guy he was, what a wonderful speaker she was, but leaves people thinking and acknowledging the greatness of God. That would be true success if at the end of our lives that could be said at our funeral. Not that they wanted to be like us or followed us or admired us. But they want to have God working in their life as he was working in our life. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we don't want people to look at us and remember us, but that through us, Lord, you could be glorified. You could be used. You could use us. You could be praised, O oh God, that your purposes and work could be accomplished, that you could use us, that your Holy Spirit might be upon us as we seek to reach the lost and make disciples. Lord, we are desperately in need of help. So, Lord, please hear from heaven and answer our prayers. 
for your Holy Spirit to be upon this church, each person, that your Holy Spirit would be upon us as we minister and seek to make known your goodness. I pray your Holy Spirit would be upon those who right now are trying to make their workplace a missions outpost. Lord, I, I pray you would bless Ted and Channel Locks and starting that track ministry. Lord, I pray for those at Home Depot they are desperately trying to develop relationships with people that they're working with to have opportunities to talk to them about Jesus and for some discipleship to take place. Thank you for those, Lord, at 86 Acres who are using their business as a testimony for Christ and a missions outpost to point others towards the Lord. Well, we pray your Holy Spirit would be upon them there, all of these places, Lord. We pray your Holy Spirit would be upon us, empowering us, going before us, not that we would do anything in our own strength, but that we would see you daily and weekly, Lord. Evidence of your Spirit working and using us in Christ's name. Father, thank you again for your goodness. 
Thank you for all the ways that you show yourself faithful to us. Thank you that you don't forsake us. Thank you that your mercies endure. Thank you that you strengthen us and restore us, Lord. And God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would rest upon us as we do your will, seek your face, and desire to point others to you, Lord. We want to live in your presence. We want to live daily with your Holy Spirit upon us and working through us. We want to experience and see your power at work using us, Lord. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.